Okay, and we're back. Um, and then now, Dwight, were you, did you have something you wanted to work on and share, or am I thinking of a different Dwight? Dimitri is also asking to. Yeah, Jean, I think you had something he, he has to work on as well. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry, Dimitri, I didn't see. Um, well, since you have a quick question, how about we, Dimitri, why don't you go ahead with your quick question? There, you should be able to mute yourself now. Good evening. Okay, I have a, a quite a simple script and the purpose of the script is uh, I have a folder where I always uh, print my PDFs inside. And then when I'm mailing things, I would like to have a, a quick menu to insert the PDFs into the mail. And uh, certainly I would just like to have the last five PDFs something that I could choose from. I'll share my screen because I actually have uh, already something that works, but uh, it fails on, on some issue. For example, I have here a message, an empty message. And if I press F12, oh, nothing happens because I'm not running it. <laughs> It's because you're on a webinar live. That's when it all yeah. breaks. Yeah. Um, here is my folder with some simple PDFs. And if I press F12 here, I get the option to insert them. And this actually already works quite well. So I can actually, I already posted this question on the forum, but Nobody answered. I was a little bit surprised because most of the time <laughs> they help you. But uh, my issue is, is if you have uh, not the window in a separate window, then it doesn't work. Actually, something else uh, happens. Uh, for example, I try to uh, answer this mail. And now, now I try to insert the PDF. And it's not answered. But they, it's inserted into the original mail. Yeah, I would so say my I'm... question is, I need to connect to the open uh, new mail. Um, this is actually my code. It's quite short. So um, this is actually just for building up the, the menu. And here I try to connect to the, to the email. And this is the code that actually works to connect to the open uh, mail if it's in a separate window. But uh, this seems to, to fail. Uh, I'm not sure if somebody has experience how to connect to the to to that specific email. Well, here's where I got just a tiny bit confused on that. When you were trying to insert, when it was in the same GUI, all one piece, yeah. and you were trying to insert, were you inserting it into a reply or because I didn't see the actual reply there? I'll do it again. Uh, So now I'm typing a new email. Yes, a reply on this email. Okay. Okay. And now I try to insert it. So I have my menu of the, the PDF. So I, I, I think to insert I... It, and it fails to insert it into the new mail. And well, it the... actually is inserted here. Right. Because, because on the, that's not the active mail. Right. I mean, that's what I think is going on. Don't ask me to fix it, but I'm just saying, but I think conceptually otherwise, the, the, the active mail is still like, why don't you do a message box of your active mail before you insert? I think you'll see it's still the old mail. Yes, that's true. So my question is, how do I 
uh, capture the active male. <laughs> well, how, yeah, how do you shift the focus, right, to the new one? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't work with my email in line like this, so the, I've never done it myself. Um, but yeah, at least we understand what's going on. Because the selection still, the selection is based off the other thing. It's not your new thing. Yes. Any ideas, Jackie? Are you Googling? I was just seeing if I could find anything useful. But yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing anything just off the bat. It's the idea of it is how to actually find the current item or shift to the item you have in that preview or view window or whatever you call that. Right. Um, and it's hard to actually say for sure what's uh, how it's structured in um, Outlook. Those of you who haven't done stuff with with Calm and even with Outlook, the uh, the the Calm object in Outlook, like oh mercy, right? It's there's a lot. It's it's amazingly powerful, but wow, it's very confusing. Yeah, and there's a lot of ways to get different the same thing, and so it can be very very confusing. Yeah, unfortunately, because I don't work that way, none of the I have a lot of examples of using Outlook, but none of them are on that because I don't I don't use it that way. So I don't know where to start. Yeah, okay, it was just a question, but if nobody has any experience of it, uh, um, it's not necessary to, to solve it right now. But I was just thinking maybe somebody had already experienced it. As, but I really like the idea because it's quite useful. Uh, I have a hotkey to automatically uh, make PDFs, and then it's quite easy to insert the, the last one in that folder. And back on your other screen, I, I, if I remember correctly, there was a button that says pop out, right? Is that right? And, and if you do that, then you have no problem, I'm going to guess. Yes. Yes. Then it's indeed working. Right. And that's obviously because then the focus is now on this one and it's the active one. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I could make it so it clicks on the pop out, out right. window first. Yeah. Yeah. It's a stupid, not stupid, but it, yeah, it's not ideal, but it'd probably solve your problem. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I'd say it, because I haven't done it before, it would probably take me as long to Google the answer as it would you. I'm sure you have already tried to figure out what method you could use. But yeah, I'd, I'd go the route of actually looking how to access the body of the email uh, in uh, the unpopped out state. There's most likely lots of VBA code out there that you can search and, and find methods of accessing it without popping it out. Yeah. And that's what you need. And I saw you were using the Active Explorer, which is normally the inbox. Um, it might be one of those, or as you had with the Active Window there and using the current item. I, again, that's how I would usually have done it. But again, the why the way they've chosen to do it with it integrated, I'm not sure where that where it's at. You would need to even look at the documentation or find someone else who had done it before. Yes. Okay. Thanks for uh, just. Uh... Yeah. Sorry. I, I I've done oh, a lot. Oh, it's nothing. Uh, it's a it's a challenge, and it's nice that we don't have always every answer. <laughs> Right. Well, next month you can tell us how you solved it. <laughs> if I got some time, uh... you, you most likely do. You could probably find a good way to access it as it is. Yeah, I guess. So. You know, back just back to your uh, original concept. I do think that's pretty cool, right? Hey, if you're constantly working with some files, 
having those things available like that, that's, that's awesome, right? Easily shove them in there. That, that's great. Yeah, actually, now I have always that window open and then I just drag and drop. That works also quite well, but this would be even uh, faster. And that's also a thing if you're automating things. Um, now I'm at the point that it's not an issue. Is it possible? Because it just is a matter of time. But the thing is, uh, great ideas are very valuable. And how can we save time? What is worth the effort? And uh, what is interesting to, to play with? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was earlier, that was part of my answer was like, well, you know, there's the quick and easy way and that sometimes that's what you want, right? And then, hey, if you're sharing this with other people or you plan to use it at multiple computers and you know, and then there's, which is what you really know too. Is it really worth it? How much time is it going to save you? Cause, uh, boy, sometimes you can think, wow, this would be really cool, but you know, what is really just clicking it with, you know, it takes me a second to click it. Um, it's something I use twice a month. It's just not worth the effort. That's true. But still you learn from it and from searching for it, you, uh, you are getting experience. And yeah. later on, you can reuse that experience. Yeah. To... Which Jackie and I have talked several times about. If you're ever doing something, you know, and you're thinking, well, but I don't know if I'll ever use this. You will, right? Like, just trust me. You'll, you, no matter what you automate, you end up borrowing from it later. I totally agree with that. You, you end up using that skill in some way or another later on. It's worth doing it. Yeah. John, did you have a, a question? Yeah. Hi, everybody. It's a pretty basic issue I have here. I'll share my screen. But it just doesn't work. Um, <laughs> it's about uh, WinMove using the WinMove command or WinRestore in conjunction with the, the, the PID. I think it means process ID that is returned when you run uh, an application. So I will first show you how it works when I'm using as the window identifier, the title of the window, it is French Explorer here. So it will restore, I will maximize it. It will be restored and then moved at a given location here. So first running that, I will run it step by step. So we have Explorer started here. I will maximize this just to see that the next command, which is, okay, I captured the, um, the process ID and we'll see it later. I would like it to work later, but it, at this time it does not. So next step, there's a sleep because uh, playing with Windows is good to give some time to Windows. So now the restore command will restore my window here and the next command will move it at 100 by 100 here on the top left. So this worked with the um, with the using the title here, which is the French version of uh, Explorer. So I will just now switch to instead of using the title, I will use the process ID here that is concatenated with A AHK ID, which is one of the ways that uh, we can identify a window with AutoAd key and try running the same thing here. Okay, so we have the window, we have the ID, which is 3908. Then the, okay, I'll maximize before just to see if the restore works and the restore does not work. And the move, of course, I'll restore before, oh, this line should be, should be commented out. So it will work now, but if we were using, let's start it again, using just the last line here. Maximize manually, try to restore, it doesn't work. Restore manually try now to win move and it doesn't move. So 
It means that this way of identifying a window, which is AHKID plus the process ID that is returned by Windows uh, and by uh, auto at key when you run an application, it doesn't work. So I was just wondering if someone is using it and at some point it worked, I used it in the past and it worked, but for now I can't make it work. And I'm wondering if, if there is something stupid here that I'm doing <laughs> that, that is making it uh, not working. I don't think that it's something that you're doing, um, but have you checked the PND uh, multiple times over? After, yeah. have you checked the PND of the window? If you get the Explorer exit and you get the PND, you store it, and then you manually change the size or whatever you do, and then you get the PND from the window once more. Does the process ID actually change? Right. Okay. So you mean if I run Explorer here? Yeah, and you grab the PND and you also grab, let's say, the um, uh, HWND of the window. So you have two separate ways of. Um... Okay, so to get the ID, um... if win, ex uh, win exists with A or with uh, the name of the, the window. Yeah, or the PND. Okay, you mean PND? You mean PID? Yeah. Yeah, PID. PID. Okay, I. Can you zoom uh, in just here, John? Yeah. So using this ear. Yeah, you probably would need to tell it that it's the PND you're using. Sorry, I can hear you. Yeah, I'll just change to my headphones. Sorry, give me a minute. Uh, Will the win exists? Yeah, and I will assign. I will assign it to the uh, win. Um, I'll just call it ID here. Yeah, but you'd probably need to tell it that you want the ID of the from the PND. So AHK underscore PID here. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I have. Oh, here I say ID. It's ID, not PID. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's ID and PID are not the same thing. The ID is the HWND. Okay, so if I do it here, maybe all what I was trying would work. Yeah, maybe. Ah, huh. huh. it's awesome. <laughs> I said stupid. And then I saw that this <laughs> variable name here, you change one letter and it is stupid. <laughs> so that's right. That's hilarious. Okay. Maximize. I have this number here, which is now with no EHK PID and the PID. And I forgot to restore it. So so that's what I want to use. And yeah, so there was a mistake when I was saying ID instead of PID. Mm -hmm. But now it should work, isn't it? Yeah, it should. The win restore, what does that actually do? Doesn't it just restore it back from minimized? Yeah, when it, when it is maximized or, or minimized, it will restore it to normal. Oh, so it also works on a maximized window? Yeah, on both. Right. Okay. Yeah, both okay. ways. Okay. Yeah, and it works if I'm using the window title here. Mm -hmm. well, I'll try it again just to see if... So I have my window, I will maximize it. Next, I'll get, I'll check that I have my EHK PID. Yeah, we no longer know if that actually is the right ID. Why would it change? Yeah, why would it change? But has it changed? Yeah, so yeah, you're right, we don't know. So it didn't restore and it will not move even if I, I would have done that before. 
to restore it manually. So, um, so what is the ID here uh, again? That is the WND, that's the window ID. It's not the okay, that's what you get from WinExist. Okay. Yeah. Instead of the process ID. So I will just restore. Get so the because the process ID and the window ID doesn't the process and the window ain't necessarily correlated. Yeah. yeah the, and the to process get... is like an instance of it. Is that correct? So you could have multiple and it would be that. Exact instance. A process can have multiple windows. Mm, okay. So, so a window, you couldn't say that a window has a process ID or you, yeah, you could, but a process ID could have multiple windows. Well, then shouldn't we be, we shouldn't be using it, should we? I don't know. It, it, if the process only has one window, that would probably be fine, but it, if it has multiple or if it, if the process somehow changes, mm -hmm. I don't know if it does, but if it did, it's... But I guess the question would be is why wouldn't we use just the regular ID? The, the because HDMI? we get the, the process ID back from run, which makes it simple to use. You would run a program, that window opens, you know the process ID, and you want to keep using that. Uh, so you don't have to wait for the window to exist. And if it's a hidden window, you don't need to turn on detect hidden windows and stuff like that. It's okay, easy. so I'll just... Hmm. So instead here, I will do ID, ID. So AHK ID, which is the idea of the window that I got from with exist. Mm -hmm. Sleep, restore, didn't work. And move, oh, uh, yeah, of course. The active window is now, it was returned, it was the, it was the editor's window that was. Uh, so instead of using the win exist A, yeah, Use the, the HK PID uh -huh. with your PID. Yeah, I'll do it. Because I don't want to use the title, the text title, because it's not reliable. And I think that an ID is more reliable if it works. So I will say here a HK PID. And this PID. Okay. And the reason you are getting none there is because you didn't wait for the window to exist. So yeah. the win exist yeah. will actually return a non-existent uh, window oh, ID. Yeah. Give it a little break here. Close it. No. So when when I'm using EHK PID, I doesn't get the handle. So the PND doesn't really have a window ID associated with it. <laughs> that would explain a lot, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, so it means that just this just does not work. It's yeah, that process ID and that window, those two ain't really connected. If you use, let's say you use your method and you use the hotkey um, spy, you could um, you could compare the PID you get with the one you get when you hover over. Yeah. Where is the spy here? Spy here. Okay, let's try it. I don't want to take too much time. Maybe after that, if someone else has something. Yeah. Okay, so here. Uh, my windows. Ah. 
I can't see, I can't get WinSpy to show up here. Okay. You can uh, double click the running script, right? is running or what? Maybe it's just not configured. I, didn't, I haven't used it for some time here. But you can launch it from the system tray on any sort of an icon. Can you right click and say on a running auto hotkey script? Yeah, you can right click it and get uh, the Windows by from, from any running auto hotkey script. Yeah. I just can't, can't hear. Sorry. Uh, on the system tray, right click yeah. on a on an icon on a running auto hockey script. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can get Windows Spy from there. Oh yeah. Get it. And um, there's that. So the PID, I have the PID here. Yeah. But you don't have anywhere where you actually show the PID in your script currently. So I'll try it again showing the PID now. And then you're just going to see if they line up, Jackie. Is that your yeah? It's just first test? an idea. Yeah. Sure. That's the reason. Okay, so the Mr. Bush will will show the show both. Yeah. HID will be the handle, and we'll stop here for now. And I will close this window. Close this window too. Okay. Okay, so that's this window here. Isn't that the same number? Yeah, it is. 14, yeah, okay. So the message box is here. Wow. So the process ID three 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 two, which is not what we get here. Oh, but you're not. I don't. Yeah, I'm not. It's not the same window. Okay, here. So they're they're not returning the same PND and PID. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm selecting here. It's not the same for the PID, yeah, and so I don't because I'm using the PID. So if instead of using this, I will do, I will use the the. The text title here. Yeah. Dimitri put something in the chat about maybe it's accessing a hidden window and gives code if we want to try it. So now you're getting the correct, or, or not the actual correct, but more correct. Yeah, here uh, it's written <laughs> in hexadecimal, yeah. it doesn't help. <laughs> huh. And if you. And the PID is not. At least it's in the ballpark. It is not correct. No, the PID, PID is still not the exact one. Yeah. But they're cousins. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if Okay, you... so I'll try to continue uh, investigating. Look that, at, but, hey, uh, Jean, take a look at what Dimitri put in the chat. Um, yeah. Because it's easy to just grab. When get output var list. Because here's the thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's no matter what, there's always multiple instances of Explorer running, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I get your point, Jackie, or the, when you're saying the line three, when you launch it, you're grabbing it and storing it, right? That's That's how, that's why this should work. Yeah, that's again. I've had multiple issues with trying to do exactly what John is doing here. Well, so, so it's not yeah. anything. It's not weird to me that he's having issues. But yeah, I've dropped and, and, entirely using um, the PND uh, the PID from run. It, it's just not reliable enough. But this is that's this this is all really fascinating to me because I don't play with this much. But I thought it was very quote unquote clear and I just didn't get it because I've tried when I'm like all right I, I I just don't this doesn't make sense to me whatever should we just for considerations for fun try using notepad and seeing if notepad if they're the same seeing if it's like an explorer thing versus yeah because notepad to, to, in my be... experience explorer was the most reliable playing with that I tried with notepad it wasn't working 
using PIM. Well, I'm just curious though if, so you, yeah, if you change I line three here. so if you change line three to line four yeah. does it line up with the window spy tool that's just one thing i'm curious but, at but right now joe he actually tried this piece of code and win get didn't return a list of windows it returned a zero so the pid from that run didn't have any windows associated with it yeah. So, so the run with the PID, it simply did not work. It, right. It, it has no window to process, or if it even has a process uh, in that PID. If you actually go to the run command in the, the help file. To run? Yeah, just uh, you're in the help file behind you. Or yeah. Behind. And go okay to, to find the, right, the help for run. Yeah. And yeah. if you look under the PID here, yeah. You have four commas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The second parameter is empty, and the third is is empty. Yeah, and as it says here, the variable will be made blank if the PID, okay. So if the PID could not be determined, which usually happens if a system verb document or short code is launched rather than a directly executable file. So yeah. as, as it said here, it's, it's not, truly a reliable method of doing. yeah yeah well okay so I'll try. doesn't that just doesn't that just mean that he should just launch it and then go loop across all open explorer windows and find the one he wants but how would he know the one he wanted if he doesn't want to use the title of it because when i run i know this is this window that i want to control so after that it's to me it was looking like the most reliable way to get an handle to the window, but uh, it seems that it's more complex than that. Oh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I'll, if I find something, I'll do like Dimitri and come back to you next month with the solution. <laughs> Hopefully. Thanks, John. Thank you. Also have this shell run and stuff like that we could use, but yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I've I seen some stuff with using the PID before. I thought it was um, very consistent. So it's interesting to see it's, I just never really did much with it. If, if you do it with something that only has a single instance, if you're oh. running, I don't know, or snag it most likely, mm -hmm. which doesn't have multiple windows, that process has that window and those two are interconnected. But when you're doing it with uh, Windows native programs that you don't know how many are or how are actually launched. When you launch Explorer Exit, you're just telling Windows that I want Explorer Exit and how Windows actually launches it for you because okay. Explorer Exit doesn't exist exactly where your script is at. So Windows in, is using a verb to actually do that. Do you get what I'm saying? I, I do. I'm telling I it do. the entire uh, path to Explorer when you launch Explorer. Yeah. Windows is yeah. interfering. And because it's that way, there's that it's not so clear exactly how it came to be. So getting uh, that ID is just. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's how he's trying to kind of tell right. you in the documentation that it might give you issues. Whereas if you're actually pointing at an exact file, you know where it's located. And I don't know if you actually located the Explorer exit, if it had would. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, what it, there is an actual explorer.exe, right? That, yeah, it's located. Uh, in, in the Windows uh, System32 folder, is that where it is? Yeah, probably, yeah. Sys32? should be somewhere in there. Are you looking for it, Joe? No, I was replying to somebody. Yeah, 
It's just the idea as you said, it might be there. I don't know, John, if you want, if you're interested in still trying to solve that or if anyone else has something they're working on, they want to help with or want to share. <clears throat> Let me see if it looks there. Someone was asking about just uh, having creating a GUI and storing the results and stuff in either database or Excel. I'm like, yeah, actually, in, and that was one John led for us probably what, like a year ago, maybe a little longer of, of connecting to a SQLite database. Um, that was a pretty awesome webinar. We And then there's also, there's SQLite and MySQL. There's actually an ADO database built into Windows also that you can do some stuff in as well, but I would probably go the SQLite route. Um, the MySQL, if you have, if you're going to have multiple people connecting it and querying it at the same time, that's where you want to use MySQL, but that would be like up in the cloud on the server. Um, but then if multiple people are hitting it, you don't have it conflicts. If it's one person running it, you can run it from your computer or whatever, and uh, it's perfectly fine. Anyone have, oh, actually, Jackie, do you want to you want to see if if uh, anyone can answer my little thing I was working on? Oh, oh yeah, that was a good one. Probably they probably can. It was it was very odd. Let me let me share my screen here. Um, I have this little resizable GUI that I use a lot, and I was actually using. I was going to include it in the files for the uh, every uh, fiddler everywhere. Um, and then I would did an API call to download, and let me. Let me see where did I close site? It should still be open in site. Um, it downloaded this file, um, and so that's when I what I realized was let me let me launch this. When I show it in a message box, it does it just fine. It reads the file, displays it just fine. However, when it gets to this GUI, so if I just hit OK, basically, oh, sorry, uh, we were Jackie and I were were messing with it. Um, No, why did that not? Oh, we changed it down here. That's where it was, right, Jackie? Does yeah. this look right? I think we were just doing this when we were demonstrating it. So here's the file. Um, I get this can't create control error. Um, and it was just, to me, um, I, I thought there was something wrong with my API syntax and that. And then I finally said, well, let me break it down and just show, let me just, pop this text in there and I was still getting just with text this error. Um, has anyone ever had a problem with just displaying some text in a GUI? This one shouldn't be that hard. We had a few minutes, maybe two or three minutes to look at it just before yeah, we started. Very, really hard. And again, it's text in a control. It should be fairly straightforward. So none of us had that straight up idea of why this was an issue. But Joe, if you moved the GUI out of um, uh, the function, if you just moved the last four lines of the GUI um, up uh, outside of the function. So here? You no, know, show add font and resize maybe. Yeah, I start to show and font and we re research so there. Yeah, and just copy those uh, right below your message box. Like so, and see if, if if that has anything to do with it. It did not. So here it's saying specifically W because you don't have any value for your W. So remove the sizing. No, oh, I tried. Okay. That's removing, so so we remove those as a factor. Nope. Let's get rid of that as well, because that's not needed, right? No, not really. Nope. Well, let me get rid of this just because we don't need it. Um, and, and this, there's nothing there that that shouldn't actually even that shouldn't matter, right? 
No. So what? What in the world? So if you put something in a variable instead of uh, your content of your file. If yeah, you I, put, I, and that works fine. Yeah. Okay. Could you put the value of text in text? <laughs> Is it that works fine? Yeah. Yep. So it might be the size of it. It's, is the file text large in any way? It's uh, I mean it's not tiny, but I've I've well, fair enough because uh, um, options. It's the wrap out. No, that's the output. So the wrap's not on. Um, but let's see here. So I'm trying to think of the easiest way. Here we go. We'll go here. I don't think it's a big, you know, it's 106 kilobytes. Does yeah. that help you? No. no. That's but is it possible there's some sort of a, a Unicode or, or some sort of character in there that the GUI is having a problem with? Perhaps. It's unsure of what format the text is, but that's it's weird that out of hotkey should handle it with the variable. You know what? Let me confirm that there's nothing in my other. No. Okay. And how about if you just create a, a big edit control and try to copy the text into it? You open the file manually, you copy yeah, the text and you paste it in. Um, I probably want to put back in the, uh, the size, but, um, well, I, I tried to paste, but I don't know what I'm... So, uh, uh, it's after that, is that this here with, yeah. Why, what, what's wrong with that? Did it say something was wrong? Oh, you're missing a comma after I did edit? Oh. Back, copy, paste. Let's see, and that's the ending. It's an HTML file. That's the end of it. So it took it as, as much as we can tell. That's the beginning. Yeah. How wild is that? Isn't that weird? So the issue might be with the creation of it where something is off. How about if you just create it with um, dummy text and use a GUI control to, to input it afterwards? Um, do I really need dummy text there? I can just... Oh, you probably just, don't need dummy text for just right. Um, it's been a long time since I've done it. So, what would I type here? Like a control set or? Yeah, GUI control, I think it's called. Yeah. Comma. And uh, I think you just leave that one blank. And for the next one, you would need the ID that you removed earlier, the HWID. Okay. The ID for now, we'll fix it here in a minute. No. And then here, can I do that? Oh, yeah, if, if you wanna copy it into the flipboard, sure. I, I okay. just, just it, wanted to put the text. Well, I figured this would be the easy way, right? Um, uh, now here I put, uh, an H and then ID, is that right? H, W, N, D. But H, W, N, D, but don't I need the ID? H, H, oh, oh, sorry, H, W, N, D, then ID. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now save it, reload it, come over here, copy. Didn't paste it for some reason. It didn't. So you pasted that in? Yeah. So it's on the clipboard, but it's not setting it for some reason. 
So you'd need something in degree control more than what I told you. Uh -huh. um, I'm unsure of what you might need to look that up in the help file, degree control. Oh, hey, hold on. John actually, uh, I think you saw, John, you wanna share your solution there? Uh, yes, where is it? It's yeah. Here. Let's, let's let's take a look. I, I I'd yeah. love to see what actually worked. So uh, it's now set for to run Win, uh, window uh, Word Windows Word. Are you sharing? Uh, no, I'm not. I will. So it's running here uh, my instance of Win Word Windows Word, and I'm capturing the PID. And I'm using the PID to restore and to move. So let's run it. So I'll maximize it. We see the, the PID 9988 that will be used. So it, it restored and it moved to 100 to 100 years. So it worked and same thing for Notepad. So, this is just to confirm that the issue is really with the the, um, uh, the explorer and the way Windows manage the the explorer windows or instances, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, Jackie and someone else. So it's very so. In PID seems to work at least with these two other application Notepad. It it was also working with Notepad. So if I run the same thing here. And I will maximize my notepad window and it will be restored and moved. So it works. So, so for me, the path to explorer is just c colon slash windows slash explorer.exe. Yeah, but uh, it's in the path. So entering just explorer will also work. Well, I, I mean, my thought is it's just more specific, right? So may, maybe that would help, but maybe, maybe it doesn't. You're telling it this is the explore thing I want you to launch. Coming back to what Jack and maybe, yeah. you know, maybe it doesn't do anything. But is it I under Windows it's... System Thirty Two? No, just ex just Windows. Just Windows. Yeah. So it was working. I'll maximize. So nothing happened. So it's, okay. it's the same. Is the same executable regardless of the the path here. Pretty okay. sure. So uh, it was just a follow-up to say that uh, the PID is not uh, uh, unreliable by itself. It's just depending on the application. And in, in the case of uh, Explorer, it's not; it cannot be used. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to you. Um, and back on this, why well, forget? What, oh yeah, there's something else with this. Uh, try to drop the, the clipboard part of it. Maybe just go with uh, checking out the GUI control and see what you actually need to put in there to make it work. Sorry, I don't understand what you, you're saying. Look up GUI control in um, the, the help file. Oops, well, yeah. Just to see the actual syntax needed. The sub command needs to be blank if you want to put new content into the control. Okay. And the control ID should work with uh, any type of otherwise control ID can be either classes M and M or the controls text or both. Mm. Control ID from 1104 can be the HWND of a control. So, should we be doing text? Hmm? This is no, text changes the text caption of the control. Oh, the caption. Yeah, that shouldn't be needed. It should just be blank as you have it. And uh, the, the only issue is that you have your ID as a non variable. So you're saying that the word ID is the one you need to use. You need to have um, presented signs around ID. Uh, up yeah. right here? Yeah. Yeah. Most likely, yeah. Oh, 
That's my clipboard. Hold on. Glad I had my little test in there. So that's that. Oh, hey, look, that worked. Good job. So that so it, it shoved it all in there. Okay, so try and change the clipboard part of it to the actual text variable instead. So what? Okay, so the issue is in the creation of the control. Yeah. So, so for some reason, when you yeah. create it and trying to shove that much content into it at the same yeah. time, something goes awry, yeah. whatever it might be. Um, yeah. But this is how I get it. I understand now how to fix the issue. Thanks for working through. Yeah, I never would have figured that out. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know what the issue is per se, but at least can, can I know. can I put that sorry in, can I put that before the show? You could yeah. So that way it's it, it's a little more di, um respond not responsive. It seems like it happens immediately, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, people wouldn't see the issue. Was so, the text selected when you, it was after the show? The text, select. the text in the know. the edit control is all selected. Oh, the last time you run it, but I don't remember that it was selected. You, you I mean, all blue. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, but was it? If you, move, if you move it back to where it was, yeah. Wow, good catch. I mean, it's interest, very interesting. Something different here. Yeah. So the fo the focus is not. Uh, um, to the control when it is filled after the show. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for working through it. I'll go back and update my uh, resizable GUI. <clears throat> the GUI is nice because you can have it display big, make it bigger or smaller and close it and it closes. And it has a function, this last parameter will say, when you use it, do you want to close the script or just that GUI? And so uh, it, it's very handy, especially because like on things like this, where I don't know if people are using studio or VS code or site. And um, this way, you know, it's simple to have a GUI where we know we can dump the big amount of text instead of hoping they're using a tool. <laughs> it's good. Awesome. All right, does anyone have anything else they wanna cover? We, um, I can demo one that we're almost done with. Let me demo it real quickly here. Uh, it's not quite done, but we're going to be releasing it here pretty soon. Let me bring over my taskbar. So if I hit Control M, this little wheel, this it just launched it, right? Because right now, I think I'm actually going to, I like it so much, I'm probably going to have it always there. But when I click it, this shows me every auto hotkey running script, and I can you know, go to it and say, if I want to open the folder, reload it, edit it, exit out of it. Um, I got a lot of options, you know, for each script, regardless of whether it has a, a system icon or not. That's the beautiful thing. Like my uh, screen clipping tool and the spell check, those don't have um, system tray icons. And so how in the world do I edit those, right, when it's running? So this allows me to easily come in here, oh, I want to edit it or I want to pause it or whatever, right? Interesting. So, a good way to reduce the number of icons in your tree. Yeah. If and, you set all your script not to show the icon, so you can use just this right, one. Right. Yeah. And I can say, let me exit out of this button. Reload. This is my up the top, my my clock in the top right there. It's my start menu, which is an auto hockey script, right? So I'm going to exit that. And it actually, you know, this this is dynamically. Um, oh, it's supposed to it exit. It didn't exit. Let's try it again. Oh, there it goes. Um, oops. So yeah, it's now it's gone now. So it, it, it should relaunch itself for you. Um, yeah, we got it. We, we, we borrowed the concept from another script and then I love this, like be able to jump to that folder if I want to, which did that actually open? Like I, this is why we haven't released it yet. Um, that toolbar is nothing. Let me see if I can open script folder on that one. There it goes. I'm curious uh, to so see if uh, it will offer to edit an executable file. It, well, you saw QAP there. Um, yeah, I did. 
oops, wrong thing. Yeah, uh, and that that was an exe, um, which obviously this would not these would not work, right? So maybe we should say uh, if yeah, it is so an EXE, most would work. Well, the exit would most work. Will work yeah. except the except the edit. Yeah. Yeah, but reload yeah, would so work. We should, yeah, so maybe we should uh, consider that. Um, what we were here's the one that we haven't the nut we haven't cracked yet. So, as Jean Jean, if you don't know, is the author of Quick Access Pop Up, right? It's an amazing tool. Um, it has its own icon. Well, we want to be able to go grab the icon of, especially if it's an executable, go grab that icon. However, we were we were playing with this for quite a bit of time, and uh, it's a bit harder than you might think to go actually loop over all the icons that are actually in the system tray and get the actual icon. Um, but that, if it is an executable, you could get it from the exe file. We don't know. We don't know which one. First one. If you usually it's a good uh, yeah. uh, standard if you say that the first icon in your executable file should be the main icon that you want to be yeah. used. Well, that's yeah, but but also like even for other things that are auto hockey scripts, like some of ours, the screen clipping tool and stuff, they they have we have uh, set the system icon in a different way, and so anyway, we're working on programmatically getting it. So yeah. that'll be a nice one um, once we get there. Oh, sorry. Interesting. Um, good to, good to Dimitri, I think, said he had something. Hello. Hey, Dimitri. Actually, um, I uh, found on your YouTube channel uh, quite an interesting script uh, uh, for API calls, because uh, lately I find them more and more interesting, and I want to find out about them. and. I also tried web scraping a little bit and I discovered that sometimes it's easy to use an API call and sometimes URL download to file works better. And yeah, and I, I, I actually, I tried to find your script, but I couldn't download it anymore. So I recreated it and uh, made a little GUI for it. So you could easily, uh, check and uncheck the parameters. I can show you. Cool. Share. So, so it also works with uh, with Fiddler because it's quite easy to collect uh, the headers from it. So it takes this data and then uh, reshapes it. And uh, these are all the parameters. And these are all the headers that you can uh, check or uncheck. And then you can uh, send the request. And he also builds uh, the a uh, out out key code for you. So if you want to copy or paste it, uh, you can do that. Um, the Fiddler everywhere allows you to select and unselect the headers now, which is pretty nice. Uh, I'll I, say yeah. that it's, it is very convenient. Yeah. And I also wanted to add some extra. You sometimes you use uh, converter to JSON and things like that. I I'm also planning to put that inside to it, and also maybe a button to use uh, URL to download. Maybe that's quicker. Well, to, to generate maybe like that. Let me interrupt you there. For I'm just curious on Jackie's lessons because my understanding is the URL to download is actually relying on. Internet Explorer in some ways, if you look at the documentation, I think it says it is. Is that something we have to worry about it going away? No, the, the, the URL download to file is not using Explorer per se. Oh, it's using okay. INET, I think, which is good okay. in, yeah. Uh, it's an older method used in Windows to do the same thing as HTTP request. Okay, thank you. I yeah. thought in the documentation it said it was. Maybe I'm mis misremembering it. Depending on what you're doing, most likely. Yeah. What I'm also learning is that uh, a lot of sites try to block you if you make too many calls. And what worked for me was to, to rotate the uh, user agents. That was uh, my fix. Well, the first thing I would say is make sure you include a user agent. Right. Um, that that's the one that I would definitely say is don't 
don't send it without one. Um, having one definitely helps. Yes. And also the cookies. Uh... Right. And that's also something that I learned uh, that you can also, um, if you use JavaScript, you can also uh, request the cookies to get them on a different way than to use uh, Fiddler. Uh, it's just so, the documents po point cookies and you, then you have the cookies. Yeah, but um, just to clarify also, right, there are public APIs and private APIs, and then there's just the, the one, which I guess they're one of those two, but the, the things that your browsers are hitting, right? Um, companies, you know, have documented APIs where you have a, a key and a token usually, right? And the OAuth that you have to deal with. But those, generally speaking, you're not using cookies, right? You're not imitating a browser. You're just, you're doing API calls to a, a database that they've set up and you don't have to worry about all that other stuff. There might be fees, right? Um, but it's really fast and it's really amazing what's available. Now, some sites don't have APIs, public APIs that are available for you to use. And that's where using Fiddler, you can start inspecting it. And of course, even in Chrome, you can use the network, you know, the, the developer tools to see your network traffic and kind of do a lot of this. However, and that was where Isaiah had never used Fiddler. And when we started showing him with Fiddler, how easy it was to see that and not just to see your browser traffic, but also your auto hotkey traffic and also within Fiddler to recreate your calls, right? I was like, oh, it's so much easier than just looking at it in Chrome and hoping to replicate it. You know, you can't see where you're going wrong, right? And that's why I love using Fiddler to send it and then look at what your browser did and go, oh, here's here's what it's doing, right? It's It helps a lot. I just looked up the URL uh, download to file. And it does say that it needs Internet Explorer 3.0 or later to be installed. So, so yeah, it does have some kind of interconnection with Internet Explorer. And it also says that if you're using a old enough version of Arahatki, then it will grab the, the content from IE's cache before actually grabbing it from the server. So. It's worth having in mind. Yeah. The, the other thing, and in, in Dimitri, I don't know how far you've gone down the road of APIs, right? There's the Win HTTP request, which is what we typically use, but there's also an XML HTTP request. That one automatically borrows your IE cookies. And so, it, but it also doesn't allow you to set a lot of the headers. Um, but it, it's pretty cool. And Jackie showed me how to from IE, do an API call from the GUI, right? So so no site could really tell that you're messing with it because you're making the call straight from the IE window as far as it can tell. But I have a question regarding that. Is it possible also to connect to the a Chrome instance? Not in exactly the same way. We don't, the Chrome libraries we have don't have as much control as we do over the IE uh, window because with IE, we actually have access to the top window, the, the, the head of all of the process. And by doing that, you can traverse into other aspects that you can't with our current uh, Chrome functions. So because when you use the Chrome libraries, you're using the developer tool. You're not using Chrome per se. So you're only allowed to do what mm -hmm. the developer tool is allowing you to, where with IE, you're actually fully automating IE. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, there are still some limits with what you can do with Chrome. Which is why Isaiah and I have been working really hard to kind of say, hey, let's let's not even bother um, using a browser at all. Let's mimic everything with the WinHTP requests, right? From soup to nuts, from the beginning to end. Yeah, so people are beginning to drop off, but yeah, um, thanks for, for dropping by. Now, uh, who was it here, Dan? He actually asked about REST APIs. I see he's new to APIs. So I don't remember the, what it stands for, what the shortness of REST is anymore. State and, was one of them. 
Yeah, response up something state, and then yeah. But yeah, that's what we're working with. Yeah, it's it's representative state transfer. Okay, fair enough. Um, Static is that what it is? Static because it has to be. Oh, state, state. Yeah, but the state has to be static. And then there's, because there's the other, what's the other main one? I'm already blanking on it, on the... Posts? No. No, there's a Denton post, and then there's Get. like five others. Get. No, there's... There's another one that actually where you're sending objects. And that, that, that you can send an object instead of just like text and stuff, you can literally send an object and they're much more powerful, but they're much more complex. But the, the vast majority of the last like five years, almost everything being created is our post, um, I'm sorry, our REST APIs. Yeah, it's what we're used to with URLs, right? It, it's the way that you can actually read a URL. If you weren't using the get, post, put, and delete methods, uh, then you would be using uh, more straight up HTTP calls, uh, which just doesn't soap. make much sense to us. Soap was the other one. Yeah, that's one of them. All right, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, well, like I said, we have we did a, a full webinar on it. I have several videos and talking about APIs. It, it's an amazing. It so let's put it this way: so every browser call, like every browser, every time you're using go to think you're doing API. Actually, you're probably doing like twenty API calls, right? When you load a page, right, or more. Um, the the um, the API call um, can you know often you're returning JSON or XML data more nowadays, mostly JSON, um, but the over it can also have html and all this other crap in there when you're doing web scraping you're returning often like a meg or more for a web page but with the actual data you want often it's what 100th the size of the what you want so if you can narrow it down to a very specific thing it can be lightning fast yeah you can do a lot of stuff by by doing it that way around uh that's actually um i'm not sure if it's possible but could you send a request to, uh, I want to have the content of, of that web page, but also narrow it down so you don't uh, get as many bytes? Not easily. Yeah. Because most of the time, what you would do would, you would ask the server, just like you would a normal user, give me the content of this uh, address. And then you would get the same stuff that a user would usually get. So if the user sees the entire page, that's the same response you would get with your HTTP request. If you then um, backwards engineer page and figure out that this table and this table and this table are filled by extra calls to other endpoints, then sure enough, we have done that multiple times over. If you actually figure out how they're pulling the data into their own page, you can utilize that. And by figuring that out, you can jump over a few parts of, of what they usually do. We had, one was it, it was for a driving page back in the day, Joe, where we yeah. actually found out that each time a user would um, turn the page, it would retrieve back, let's say, 10 uh, new items. But by doing that click and using Fiddler, we figured out that they had an entire endpoint for the, those uh, items. So instead of only returning 10 and letting a page load and then grabbing 10 and letting a new page load, we could just ask for a thousand at a time. So by doing that, we, we cut the wait time of our web scraping down from minutes to seconds. So the, it, it's, it's... The other thing I, I'd throw in there is, is um, we, we were looking at it, we, uh, we loaded the, this, the goal of the client was to do some stuff they wanted to see on this app developed by a certain person, like what was in the app. And so we loaded, uh, 
the app on Knox um, inside, you know, on, on our computers, right? It's an emulator for the Android environment. And then we were looking at the traffic that the app was sending. Um, and sometime on one tool, the data was all encrypted. So we couldn't actually grab, we could, we grabbed it, but we couldn't understand it because it was all encrypted, right? However, we could still copy from the app what was displayed. So we automated doing stuff that way. But another time, the data was actually, it wasn't encrypted. So like when I did, I could probably find it if I tried. Um, this guy wanted to do a reverse lookup for people's names associated to a phone number. And he's like, well, here, you know, see if you can find an API, a, a public API, uh, if we have to pay money for it, great, yeah, that's okay. Um, but he's like, I know this free app on my phone that does this for free. So I said, well, I'll look at both. So I, in five minutes, I found a public API that it's like 0.008 cents per, you know, lookup, right? It, so there was a little cost, but then I said, let me load this thing. And sure enough, in about 20 minutes from looking at the traffic from the Knox, you know, the app, I saw exactly what they were doing and there was no unique ID given to it. So I'm like, we could, we could ping this thing all day and there won't be any fees um, and it'll work just fine. So um, it's a great way that you can, this is the really amazing thing about like to me now, Wireshark is another really well-known tool. And that was what Isaiah, when I first showed him uh, Fiddler, he's like, well, I just use Wireshark for that. I'm like, so you can understand Wireshark and get the data. Like it is such a tool like to the, it's got what, like a thousand times more amount of stuff in it. It's so hard to find what you're looking for, right? Like huh. it, it's got so much stuff. It is a much more advanced um, sniffing tool so it can also sniff packages and stuff like that so sure enough Wireshark has its uses because you can do more but if you're doing like we're doing Joe stuff that is a little bit more user close uh, Fiddler does the job such so much um, simpler so you save time by not having to learn something like um, Wireshark you know what I, the analogy I would say is, I think almost everyone here, you probably use like the IWB2 learner tool for looking at stuff in IE versus, you know, inspecting it and seeing just how much stuff is there, right? And it's like, when you're new, that gets really confusing. When you've been working a long time, it's kind of easy and you can see it. But I like that IWB2 learner tool and I can just see exactly what I want. Oh, I don't have to worry about it, right? It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. No, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. API call, uh, what, calls what I do now in a lot of cases that I um, first use the a browser to collect some URLs and then you use uh, uh, the requests just to, to get the data more faster. Uh, it's indeed uh, very fast. Okay, Joe, I think we're at... Yeah, time. we're good. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next. Bring bring stuff you're working on for next month. Unless we end up having a topic. Yeah. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.